Well, if you would, please be seated. And um, as Scott mentioned earlier, Dr. Mark Searby is here with us. So would you join me in giving him a warm hand as he comes? Dr. Mark. Thank you all. Oh, what a great time of worship. Thank you so much. It's always good to be at Southside. Uh, Linda and I have said many times that if we uh, lived here in Jacksonville, this would be our church home, absolutely. Uh, thank you to all of you and to the church for your partnership with the Center for Pastoral Resilience. Uh, God has been blessing that work as I work with pastors here in Jacksonville and in Gainesville and in between. Uh, thank you for your prayers and support for the Center for Pastoral Resilience. Uh, I noticed that Scott said that uh, Gary used to consider me as his favorite professor. <laughs> now, what does that mean, Scott? <laughs> he used to. Okay, Gary is a dear friend. Uh, I love him and Sherry and their family, and glad that they're able to uh, be away this weekend. Gary asked me if I would continue in this series that you all have been in from the Gospel of Luke with the title of Inception. And so today we come to that passage in Luke 4 that we're going to look at in just a minute. Uh, but I'm more than pleased to be able to stay in this series. Luke's gospel is such a powerful gospel. As Dr. Luke wrote this gospel after having researched in depth uh, who this Jesus is. What has he done? Is he real? And what does that mean for us? So uh, thrilled to be a, a part of this series. And we're going to dive into Luke 4, but let me pray for us first. Father, we believe in you. Jesus, we believe in you. Holy Spirit, we believe in you. God, the three in one. And we have sung that belief and that praise this morning. And so now I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would be our guide, that you would be our teacher, that we might listen to your word as you convict us, as you teach us, as you guide us. And so we depend upon you, not upon our own efforts, not upon our own study, but upon you, Holy Spirit, the one who inspired and the one who illuminates your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you have your Bibles with you, or if you use a laptop or whatever you do, turn to Luke 4. And let me just quickly give a little rehearsal of what we see in Luke 4. We start out in Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan where he'd been baptized and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days. So he'd been, the father had told him, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And then the spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. Then look at verse uh, 14. After the temptation narrative that Luke records, it said, Luke records that in verse 14 that Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee. Now pay attention to how Luke does this. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And then we come down, Jesus goes to Nazareth, his hometown. And in verse 17, on the, on the day of the Sabbath, Jesus is in the synagogue. Verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Then after the, Luke tells about Jesus' encounter in Nazareth, then we come to the passage that we're focusing on today. In verse 31, Luke says that he went down to Capernaum. Now actually, he went 20 miles northeast, but he went down in elevation to Capernaum, which was along the Sea of Galilee, one of the major towns in Galilee, the Roman soldiers were stationed there. It was an important town. So Jesus goes to Capernaum, teaching on the Sabbath again. In verse 32, they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed 
authority. Are you listening to how Luke is describing this as we go through Luke chapter 4? <clears throat> then let me jump down to verse 43. Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. Do you see how Luke brings us along in chapter 4? And I believe that Luke chapter 4 is basically a tutorial for anyone who wants to follow Jesus and who wants to fulfill his or her purpose for God in their life. That's what Luke does here in chapter 4. He tells us what is it like to lead a spirit-led life. Because did you notice how he keeps saying the spirit did this, the spirit did that, the spirit's power, it's just all through this chapter. If you want to be a spirit-led Christian, I think Luke 4 kind of provides a little tutorial. When you look at Luke 4, what do you see? Well, Gary shared with you two weeks ago, he shared with you the temptation story at the beginning of Luke chapter 4. And so the Luke chapter 4, Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted. In a Spirit-led journey, you will be tempted. There is temptation. And I know that Gary, because I listened to both of those messages, got online, listened to those, I know that he talked about who Satan is and his power and how he tempts us away from God's will. He tempts us to not be led by the Spirit. Temptation. I find this so ironic. Temptation will come at times in its strongest form after we have had a great spiritual victory. When does the temptation of the wilderness come to Jesus? It's after his baptism and the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When you are tempted, when you are challenged by the evil one, do not think that there's something wrong with you, but understand that there is a battle going on. It's very normal very typical. Then you move from the temptation story into Jesus at Nazareth, hometown. He goes to the synagogue. He preaches out of Isaiah 61, and they think it's a great message until he does what? Until he says, this good news is for the Gentiles, and there is all kinds of opposition. Opposition from the hometown his friends, and his family. So you go from temptation to opposition. And do we not, again, see another great truth? When you make a decision to follow Jesus, you can expect opposition even from friends and family. I'm not going to go into great detail, but I remember one decision that I made, an important decision to follow Christ in a new, deeper, significant way. And I had a family member who did not speak to me for over a month because they were so angry that I had made this new commitment. You will be opposed, but it doesn't mean you're not being led by the Spirit. So you're going to be tempted. There's going to be opposition, and then there's going to be, as we go to the text today, you see that there's going to be distraction. There's going to be distraction. Go back to the text in chapter 4, and let me pick up there at the end of verse 42. And the people sought him and came to him and, he and would have kept him from leaving them. He'd been healing, he'd been casting out demons. The people came 
and would have kept him from leaving them. They wanted to distract him, but what does Jesus say? He said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And so another one of the enemy's attempts to discourage us and to oppose us, to tempt us, is to distract us from the purpose for which we have been called. Temptation, opposition, distraction. I'm guessing that there are others in this room who are like me. And I'm older than great majority of you in this room. But I believe that the year 2020 has been one of my greatest challenges to not be distracted from the purpose to which I've been called. And I believe as I have talked to pastors in my pastors groups, as I have talked to church leaders, that 2020 has been a year that the enemy has rejoiced in distracting us. And I'm not, try, don't read more into this than I'm trying to say, but the coronavirus, COVID, and the politics of 2020 have distracted so many believers and gotten them off course and they've gone down rabbit trails and have missed the main point of why they are called to follow Jesus Christ. Now those have been two very important issues. I'm not saying they haven't been, and they still are in many ways. But how many times have we been distracted from our mission because we have been so sidetracked into COVID issues or political things. You see, the enemy doesn't care. If he can get us off track and get us focusing on other things instead of the purpose for which we're called to preach and teach and share and live the good news of the kingdom of God, he's, he's happy. If you find yourself being completely distracted, May today be the day that you get back on track. Now, the specific text that Gary gave me to share with you today is Luke 4, 31 through 44. So as we look at this text, there's just two simple questions I want us to try to answer today out of this text. The first one is this, who is Jesus? And secondly, what does Jesus want to do in me and through me? Who is Jesus, and what does he want to do in me and through me? So let's go back to the text and answer those two questions. This is going to be very simple. It's not going to be hard at all. Let's start here in verse 31 and 32. He, was te he went to Capernaum. He was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. Who is Jesus? He is teacher. He is teacher. He is the one to whom we need to listen. He is the teacher and he has authority because Jesus doesn't need to quote other people, other things. He simply teaches with authority. Jesus is teacher. But secondly, notice where the text goes. Verse 33, and in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him having done him no harm. And they were all amazed. They were all amazed. And we also see other times 
where Jesus cast out demons. Verse 41, demons also came out of many. Jesus is teacher. Jesus is conqueror of evil. He is the conqueror of evil. Now, is this just a lesson? Is we just going to write down teacher, conqueror of evil? No, we need to understand that we live at a time at the beginning of 2021 when there is evil all around us. Now, we may not be seeing like we do in Luke 4, all of these uh, uh, people being thrown down and convulsing and all the things that Luke describes, but don't kid yourself. The evil one and evil people are all around us. But remember, Jesus is the conqueror of evil. He goes on in the text, going down to verse 38. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. This is Peter, the apostle Peter. And now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and began to serve them. And then it says, verse 40, when the sun was setting, all who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Jesus, teacher, conqueror of evil, healer. He is the healer. He is the one who can take care of all of our physical issues. He is the one to whom we turn when we are in need. Now, he is healer. He is also the proclaimer of good news. We see that he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. This is the first time in Luke's gospel that we see the phrase kingdom of God. It will appear 30 more times just in Luke's gospel. The kingdom of God, the rule of God, the reign of God in our hearts and in our minds. You will see it again and again, of course, throughout all the Gospels, but in Luke's Gospel particularly, the kingdom of God. Jesus knew why he came. He said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom to other towns as well. He's a proclaimer of good news. He did that in his message in the synagogue in Nazareth. So he's proclaimer of good news. So who is Jesus? That's who he is. Teacher, conqueror of evil, healer, proclaimer of good news. Second question. So what does he want to do in me and what does he want to do through me? Well, I want to start with what does he want to do in me? So let us go to chapter 4, verse 42. All of this healing, all of this teaching, all of this casting out of demons has been going on. And look what happens in verse 42. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. Jesus knew how to handle popularity and acclaim. Jesus knew how to handle that. How did he handle it? He withdrew and went by himself. It was day he departed and went into a desolate place. So many Christian leaders do not know how to handle acclaim and how to handle praise and how to handle I don't like to use this word, but success. What did Jesus do with it? Did he kind of strut around and say how great he was? I'm healing everybody. I'm taking care of all of these needs. No, he goes to a lonely place to be with his father. 
Notice in verse chapter 5, verse 16, just a few verses later, Luke records this. But Jesus would withdraw to desolate places and pray. He would withdraw to desolate places and pray. What does Jesus want to do in us? He wants to do a work in our hearts. There is a quote, I think we have it, a Jim Elliott quote. Uh, I think we have that to put on the screen. Uh, what he says about this, about Jesus, here it is. A lot of you remember Jim Elliott, missionary who was killed in South America, became a Christian martyr. Jim Elliott made this statement. I think the devil has made it his business to monopolize on three elements. Noise, hurry, crowds. Satan is quite aware of the power of silence. Wow. Our enemy has made it his business to monopolize noise, hurry, crowds. Noise and hurry are so prevalent in our culture. And we never slow down. We're distracted by the noise. We're distracted by the hurry of our schedules. And I agree with Jim Elliott. The devil is quite aware of the power of silence. If we will withdraw to desolate places. Now, I don't know where your desolate place might be. For Jesus, it was literally desert wilderness places in Palestine. For some of you, Maybe it is a particular room in your house. For some of you, it may be a local park or maybe the beach. It may be a woods. Wherever you need to withdraw and spend time alone with the Father. That's what Jesus wants to do in us. If our Savior needed those times, how much more do we? To recharge to be renewed, to refocus, to recalibrate so that we are focused on his mission and his purpose for us. What does he want to do in you? He wants to do his work in you and then through you. Now, as I think about what he wants to do through us, I want to take us to Matthew chapter 9. So if you wouldn't mind turning over to Matthew chapter 9. At the end of Matthew chapter 9, there is one of the summary statements that Matthew gives in his gospel. He really is doing what Luke does in different places as well. But in Matthew chapter 9, at the end of chapter 9, in the first verse of chapter 10, He's going to give us a summary of Jesus' ministry and mission. And I like the way that Matthew summarizes it so succinctly. So that's why I picked this, these verses out of Matthew, Matthew's gospel instead of Luke. So starting Matthew 9, verse 35. Here's who Jesus is and here's what he's doing. <clears throat> Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages. Notice here, notice what he does. Teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Are you following this? What I've just been talking about? Proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. So Matthew says this is what Jesus is doing. This is a summary. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. See what Jesus does? Jesus' response to those who are harassed and helpless says to his disciples, pray earnestly for workers for the harvest field to be sent out. Then what does he do in chapter 10, verse 1? 
And so he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction, and he sends them out. So what does Jesus do, and what then does Jesus want us to do? It's right here summarized in this passage in Matthew. When we look at Jesus' response, we see, first of all, his heartfelt reaction. What does he want to do through me? He wants me to see with his eyes. He wants me to see with the eyes of Jesus. When I look out on those who live around me, whether it's in my community, whether it's in Jacksonville, whether it's beyond, do I see with the eyes of Jesus? When Jesus looked out on these crowds, he didn't just see crowds, he saw individuals. And he saw people who were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I am currently reading a book uh, called The Shepherd's Life. It's not a Christian book. It's about written by a, a shepherd, a young, guy, a young shepherd who has uh, a farm in the Lake District of England. Maybe some of you have been to the Lake District. It's a beautiful area. He talks about when the sheep get harassed and how helpless they become. I just read a section in the book about uh, it was wintertime and the deep snows came and how the sheep were so helpless as they were harassed by this bad weather and how he had to go out into the fields, march through the snow in order to get them to a place of safety. When I look in the world around me, I see so many people harassed and helpless. Drug abuse, depression, anxiety are at record highs. And I realize a lot of that is COVID related, but they're at record highs. When I look around, do I see people through the eyes of Jesus? He wants me to see through his eyes. He also wants me to feel with his heart. He wants me to feel with his heart. Did you notice what it says in the text? He had compassion for them. That is a strong word. It means his guts were churned up inside as he had compassion for these people who were harassed and helpless. I'll admit, I struggle. And I think this is where the enemy is trying to get me off track. I struggle with feeling with the heart of Jesus. Because I look at people who are harassed and helpless, who are struggling, and so many times my immediate reaction, my fleshly reaction is, well, I sure wish they'd get their act together. Instead of feeling with the heart of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus. He wants us to see with his eyes. He wants us to feel with his heart. He wants us to touch with his hands. Because what did Jesus do? He was touching and healing people. He didn't care if they were sick. He didn't care if they had leprosy. He didn't care if they came from a life of sin. He was willing to touch. A healing, loving touch. Now sometimes all the touch of Jesus means is that you put a hand on a shoulder or you put an arm around somebody and you just sit with them. Many years ago when I was a sophomore in Bible college one evening as I was in the dorm I got a phone call from my home preacher Back in southern, I grew up in southern Illinois, went to Bible college in central Illinois. He called and he said, Mark, he said, your grandparents have been in an accident. Your grandma was killed instantly. Your granddad is probably not going to make it. Now, if you knew my grandma and grandpa Herring, who they stood about this tall, <laughs> both of them, 
They were salt of the earth, loving, most loving, gracious, kind people I've ever known. I was devastated. Went back to my dorm room, sat down on my bed, and just began to sob. Had one guy who came down from one another room in the dorm. He came down and he started trying to tell me how everything's going to be okay and talking to me and, you know, all of those kinds of things. I didn't hear a word he said. But I had another guy who came down from his room. His name was Art. Art came down, sat down on the bed beside me, put his arm around me, and let me cry. Didn't say a word. Sat there for, I don't know how long, 10, 15 minutes in silence. When he got up to leave, he said, when you need something, just let me know. It was a touch of Jesus in my grief and my despair. Sometimes, folks, the touch of Jesus is just a hand on a shoulder, a pat on the back, a sitting next to somebody in silence and just being there. That's what he wants. That's the work he wants to do in us and through us. All of it in the context of sharing the good news of the kingdom of God. And that good news is transformational. Let me take you back as we come to a close. Let me take you back to Jesus' message in Luke 4. What did Jesus say in his message? He took the scroll, Luke 4, 17 and following. He takes the scroll, the prophet Isaiah, he unrolls it and he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We must never forget Jesus faced temptation, he faced opposition, even from family, and he faced distraction, but he never gave up on his core mission and message to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Folks, we have the good news to give to our world today. We must never miss out on the transformational power of the message of the kingdom of God. And we must be focused on that message. Even as we see with the eyes of Jesus, as we feel with his heart, and as we touch with his hands, we must never forget it all centers on that message of good news and grace. There's enough judgment going on. There's enough anger going on. There's enough bitterness and resentment going on in our world. We need to share that message of the good news in its transformational power. Never lose sight of the mission. I want to close with a silly uh, anecdote that happened with my oldest son. John uh, played basketball at a college in eastern Tennessee. It was a school, uh, an NAIA, for those of you who know anything about it, there's NCAA and then there's NAIA schools. It was an NAIA school. It was his freshman year and Linda and I hadn't been able, we lived in Illinois, we hadn't been able to go see him play basketball very much, but finally we were able to go see one of his basketball games there at his college in eastern Tennessee. So we're watching the game and, and they do the warm-ups and after the warm-ups they all come his team comes to the center court, as a lot of teams do, and they all put their hands together like this. And when they break their hands down like this, a lot of, a lot of basketball teams will go team, 
or defense or something like that, when they all threw their hands down, they go, Idaho. <laughs> Idaho? What in the world, Idaho? So after the game's over, one of the first things I asked John after he comes out, out of the locker room, I said, okay, so what's the deal? You all come together, center circle before the game starts, put hands together, and you go, Idaho. And he said, well, Dad, that's where the national championship is. And that reminds us of our mission. Our goal is Idaho. Now, I know it would be silly <laughs> for us to do this this morning, but can you in your mind Join hands with everybody around you in a circle. And together, the kingdom of God. The good news of the kingdom. And never forget our ultimate mission of why we're here. What he wants to do through us. Father, thank you that you have given us your purpose, your mission. May we as a body of believers here at Southside join together, understanding the mission you have given us, how we are to live it out, how we are to make a difference in our world that is so fractured with people who are harassed and helpless. Lord, help us to fulfill our mission of sharing the good news of the kingdom of God. May we do it in ways that you call us to do it individually, whether it's going to a neighbor, whether it's giving uh, a cup of water, whether it's help, a helping hand, Lord, whatever. Move us, break our hearts with what breaks your heart. And help us to fulfill your mission as you give us time, as you give us energy. Thank you again, Lord, for this body of believers. May you bless each and every one, and may you bless Southside in ways beyond what they could ever imagine. In the name of Jesus, amen.